Goedemorgen allemaal. Uh, welcome to our international uh, guests. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Alex Oostvogel. I am involved with Avalon since 1999. I am co-chairman of the board together with uh, Marco Palazzi, uh, who is sitting there next to Martin. Uh, welcome. Welcome to this international conference of the organic farming and uh, our future food system. Een hele belangrijk seminar. We hopen vandaag heel veel involvement van jullie in de diverse workshops. En uh, dit gaat een prachtige dag worden als onderdeel van deze week. So this will be a beautiful day as part of the Soil Food Week. And we hope of a lot of involvement from all of you, also our international guests. We have good speakers uh, on this day. Um, I would like to introduce now to you Martin Lancaster, who will do the opening word for this uh, conference. Martin, may I have you on the podium, please? Good morning, everybody. Wonderful that you're all here. And um, a special welcome to uh, the mayor of Oostellingwerf, Harry, our host, Annie Alswart, who made available his uh, beautiful building. It smells so good, huh? Let's uh, give an applause to Annie Jan because. <laughs> you can feel the herbal atmosphere uh, in this, uh, this place. But most of all, to all the participants that are here, many of them quite young, and that's what we like very much, because it's the future for the next generation that we would like to have in our room here. And that, uh, in that way, we at least have already succeeded. Um, um, I think it's important to say that this week, the Soil Food Week, marks uh, one of the most difficult issues of our era. Um, we see that due to all the problems that we, we uh, come across in the past years, climate change, biodiversity problems, etc., more and more we are focused on the fact that agriculture and our food system are in the core of these problems and also in the core of the possible solutions for this problem. Because today we don't want to talk about the problems, but we want to talk about the possible solutions in many ways. And good morning, Willem. Um, we are very lucky that this Soil Food Week gives us the opportunity to organize this international conference. It is a week, some of you may have attended the previous events uh, on Wednesday and yesterday, and uh, there was the, the dinner for the future in Drachten on Wednesday evening. Yesterday was the Symphony of Soils, and for that a large number of uh, farmers from the whole north of the Netherlands were gathered in this room. Tomorrow will be the Festival B uh, in Drachten, a public event where many people will also gather. And today we want to focus on the opportunities that organic farming offers, but not only organic farming, but also in the broader um, uh, scope of the societal questions of, for the moment. Um, oh, there is uh, more people coming in. Welcome, join us please. And um, we had a bit of a difficult start with this conference because uh, the, unfortunately the, the funding was only available three weeks ago. So you can imagine that it was quite tough to organize this conference, but we are very grateful that we succeeded in getting quite a number of speakers here and also a large group of uh, students that wanted to join us here. Unfortunately, due to the late organization, uh, we were not able to get the minister from Wallonia, who was very interested in this, and a number of other speakers like Nadia Shalaba from FAO, who couldn't make it but wished us good, of luck, good luck. But we are especially very happy to have here the complete world board of the IFAM Organics International, the international umbrella for organic farming. Um, ten of them, plus their executive director, are joining us today in our discussions, and we can draw on their enormous expertise of the organic movement in the whole world. 
Um, also, would like to mention one person who isn't here is Professor Vladislav Popov from Bulgaria. He is uh, one of our close uh, associates of the Avalon Foundation. And it was spe specifically interesting because this week is organized also in the framework of the uh, Leeward and Friesland Cultural Capital of Europe this year. Next year, the cultural capital of Europe will be Plovdiv, Bulgaria, by coincidence. And that is very interesting because that's the only place where the Avalon Foundation has a, a branch office. So we, want to, we wanted to give him the stick for the next conference for next year, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Uh, he has too many uh, obligations at his university. But we will tell him what has happened here and we hope to be in Bulgaria next year. I would like to also thank the donor organizations that have made this conference possible. It's uh, the Vereniging Circular Friesland, the provinces of Friesland and uh, Groningen, and uh, several other uh, funders that have thought that this would be an important conference for Friesland and uh, wide surroundings. So I hope that we will be able to discuss the issues of our food system today, that we will start looking for solutions which are so crucial in the following years to come. We have seen the verdict of the court two days ago about uh, which the, the foundation Urgenda uh, had uh, set up a court case against our government, forcing them to, uh, to, to really implement measures to reach a reduction of CO2 um, within a couple of years of 50%, which is an immense, immense uh, challenge. And it certainly will also bring back the discussion on food and agriculture. We are talking here today about food, but the basis of our food is in the soil. You will hear lectures today, and we have discussions today ranging from the soil through agriculture to our food system, and this all is part of one future for our children and grandchildren. So I wish you a very, very fruitful day, both in the plenary sessions, hearing and discussing, but also especially in the groups that we will have in the tents around here on the different issues, and let's make it a very nice and fruitful day. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you very much. This is a real uh, good start, and uh, I would like to introduce now the mayor of Oost-Stellingwerf, Harry Kloost. Oost, sorry, name it Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the Netherlands, welcome to Friesland, and welcome to Oost-Stellingwerf. You're today as a guest in a green, spacious, rural municipality with almost as many hectares of land as there are inhabitants, 25,000, almost one on one. Good soil, nature, a landscape filled with forests, the agriculture activities and innovative companies here all offer an amazing foundation for tackling the challenges of today and tomorrow. And naturally, I'm talking about sustainable energy, biodiversity, healthy soils, and reusing natural refuse as raw material for new products. Our municipality has chosen uh, to focus on the bio-based economy, and we are investing substantial amounts in this project. We are working successfully with uh, local companies and students from technical and higher educational institutions to gain experience in bio-based <coughs> business. This means that this expertise isn't only going to be put to use in our own area, but later elsewhere as well. We're not just doing this on ideological grounds, but also because we believe that these new economic activities will lead to new employment opportunities in the long term, long term and so will contribute to a thriving rural economy. For example, Magandal, a company that produces biodynamic yard goods, 
is one of the fast growing, fastest growing companies in our municipality. Ladies and gentlemen, one of our most important projects is the Knowledge Center for Shoals and the Chairman Soils, which we are co-financing. Soil fertility is one of our major global issues. By investing in research into what happens in soils, we hope and expect as well that we will be able to stimulate a healthy agriculture production as well as improving biodiversity. We would have loved to have held this Congress in our nearby Biocentrum building, but unfortunately it's not, re already, uh, it's not ready for visitors yet. This knowledge center consists of more than 80% bio-based materials. That makes it one of the most sustainable and innovative buildings in Europe. It's going to be the place to be a meet for educational institutions, companies and governments if you want to know about the bio-based economy. And it's also the place where the chair in Sols is going to be based. And it's a big step for our municipality. Sustainability, sustainable soil management and the future of agriculture are all facing major challenges. The Dutch Minister for Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality phrased it well on national TV. The way in which we produce our food is becoming increasingly unbalanced. It goes beyond what the earth has to give and is not sustainable. She is arguing for a circular agricultural system because we need to ensure that our soil water and raw materials don't become exhausted and that the Earth's temperature doesn't rise in an accept unacceptable way. Circular agriculture and circular economic economy demand cooperation, an integrated approach and bundling of forces of agriculture, educators, companies and governments. We are trying to put this into practice on our scale. It is a great honor for us to receive you in our municipality here today. It's not only an honor, but it's also a much appreciated incentive for continu continuing our own chosen part. I wish you all a very fruitful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for this uh, beautiful word for Oostellingwerf. And uh, let me introduce you now to Peggy Myers, president of the IF, uh, IFOAM. Peggy, may I introduce you to the podium, please? Ambassadors of IFOM Organics International, dear colleagues of the IFOM Organics International World Board, and distinguished guests from the Netherlands and around the world. I'm honored and humbled to be with you here today in the beautiful Netherlands. Uh, I'm from the United States, by the way, and so quite frankly, I'm happy whenever I can leave the troubles of the United States behind. <laughs> here we get to focus on uh, more positive topics, such as this international conference on organic farming and the future of our food system. And this is truly a topic that affects every living being on our planet, including the animals, trees, birds, insects, and microorganisms, because we're all impacted by the use or the lack of use of chemical inputs, and the focus or the lack of focus on the principles of organic agriculture, health, ecology, fairness, and care. And today we gather to talk about the future of organic agriculture, and food, which is critical to helping save our planet. Now, I know Martine said we're gonna not focus on the negatives, but focus on the positives, but in order to frame this, I think I need to tell you about some examples of climate change and the impact of humans and the environment that I've witnessed. It, witnessed. In the United States, it's become common for us to experience massive and multiple wildfires in our western states each and every year. It's become our new normal, even though it's definitely not normal. I've had the privilege of seeing thousands upon thousands of monarch butterflies as they've made their migration from Canada to California. But we're seeing fewer and fewer of those beautiful, irreplaceable butterflies, not only due to habitat loss, 
but also due to climate change. And we often hear of airline cancellations due to snow and ice storms, but earlier this year I heard of airline cancellations in the southwestern United States due to extreme heat, which is something that was unheard of before. Just three days ago, a hurricane hit the state of Florida, and it resulted in the third lowest barometric pressure ever recorded in the United States. It was the most powerful storm ever to hit that area. The hurricane continued on to the state of Georgia, where it was the first hurricane to hit that state since 1898. On a personal note, I grew up in the state of Michigan, which is in the upper middle part of our country. Uh, in fact, I brought my Michigan map with me today. I carry it with me always. Here it is. If you're not aware, the state of Michigan looks like a mitten. And uh, here's a, just a fun fact that you can share with your family and friends. If you're in the United States or if you're anywhere in the world and you see two people, they're standing here talking to each other, they're pointing at their fingers, those are two Michiganders talking about where they're from or where they live in the state. So, just a fun fact. Anyway, as a child in Michigan, I remember enduring blizzards almost every year. And I know that, and I remember that there was snow on the ground every year from November through March. And today, when I speak with my family in Michigan at Christmas time, it's not unusual for them to tell me, oh no, it hasn't snowed in days or even weeks. And again, that's not normal. Um, also earlier this week, you may have heard that the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned that we have only 12 years to make massive and unprecedented changes before we see further increased risks of drought, floods, extreme heat and poverty for hundreds of millions of people. And all of these examples point to climate change, human created climate change, which we can mitigate and I believe even turn around with organic farming principles, practices and systems. So now I want to take a wider look at organic farming globally, and I'm going to do this in the context of um, highlighting the six features of Organic 3.0. This is a landmark initiative and document that some of you helped to create, and it's our interpretation of the continued evolution that we need to see in organic. So looking at organic farming globally, I see two different paths and diverse ways to ensure integrity, which is the first feature of Organic 3.0. And of these two different paths to ensure integrity, I see the first path being found in the United States and developing countries, where we're firmly focused in Organic 2.0, which sees regulation, standards, certification, and equivalency arrangements as the keys to guaranteeing integrity. And currently, we have unilateral or bilateral equivalency arrangements between countries. And what that means is if a producer has uh, crops certified as organic in one country, it can be sold as certified organic in another country. That would be a unilateral equivalency arrangement or bilateral if it goes the other direction as well. Um, I do believe that these equivalency arrangements will continue and they will proliferate. Therefore, we have to acknowledge the impact that these arrangements have on the producers of organic foods who sell their products in different countries. I have heard how some organic farmers have to have their uh, products certified two or three or even four times because they sell in multiple countries. And I think the solution to this is multilateral equivalency arrangements. And what that means is if it's certified organic in one country and if there's a, a, an equivalency arrangement, it can be sold as organic in multiple countries. And this can reduce the burden on farmers who do sell in multiple countries. Now, at the same time, we have to be vigilant in our efforts to root out and stop fraud, which can be attractive to those who want to make a quick profit from our sector, which you and I and all of us have worked so hard to create. Now, the second path to ensure integrity can be found in developing countries where trust is often gained through direct sales to consumers or through participatory guarantee systems, or PGS, which, can include, which include local stakeholders to develop standards and a certification program that's suited to their culture and their region. And here we should focus on innovation. That's the second uh, feature of Organic 3.0. And at the same time, we have to use innovation which respects tradition and culture while improving systems and livelihoods of farmers. May I drink from this water, Martin? Thank you. Thank you so much. I wasn't sure if someone... <laughs> okay. Um, 
The next feature in Organic 3.0 is inclusive of wider sustainability interests. We have to change the perception of organic being for the elite, being a niche, or being an exclusive club that only certain people can join. We must communicate with and collaborate with like-minded movements in areas where we agree and have common interests. An example would be the fair trade movement, which I believe would agree with the need for true or full cost accounting, which we're going to hear about later today, and which is the fourth feature of Organic 3.0. Another example is the agroecology movement, which puts people first in the center of agriculture and which supports gender equity, and holistic empowerment from farm to final consumer, which is the fifth feature of Organic 3.0. And the last feature is continuous improvement toward best practice. And this is important, especially in areas where we focus on standards and certification, because for some, certification is the end goal. Who I'm certified, I can just relax and maintain. But the reality is that certification should be the ground level from which to start and build. iFoam Organics International helps producers by providing the best practice guideline for agriculture and value chains and by offering an online best practice resource library, which is on the iFoam website. We know that farmers are getting older and retiring, uh, at least in the United States, often without a family member who's willing to take over the farm. Uh, uh, in my country, the average age of a farmer is 58 years old, and the average age of an organic farmer is 52 years. Now, especially to young people, it's still an old age, but um, we're definitely seeing young people getting involved in organic farming, and I believe that because of that, we're gonna see that average age continue to come down uh, and do so over the years. At the same time, we're seeing that millennials are driving the growth of organic sales. These are people primarily in their 30s and 40s. They're starting to get married. They're starting to have families. And they understand the benefits of organic. And they buy it primarily for their children. And sometimes they even forego organic for themselves. And because of this support of our younger people, I do see a bright future for organic agriculture, despite all the bad things I just said, uh, especially as we communicate the benefits that it provides and the solutions that it offers for today's environmental and societal problems. Okay, now my remarks are entitled <coughs> Organic Farming, a Worldwide Perspective. So I wanted to give you some statistics from this great book. If you're not aware of it, it's called The World of Organic Agriculture. It's published annually by Fibble and iFoam Organics International. It's introduced at BioFoc in Nuremberg every year. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of this book, I think, is that it truly shows that almost any country can be a leader in organic production in certain ways. Uh, this particular uh, book was published in, this year, in 2018, although a lot of the data is from 2016, uh, which was current at that time. So I just wanted to, if I had more time, I'd do a quiz and I'd hand out prizes and whatnot, but instead I'll just give you the data. Um, so I wanted to give you some key indicators in the top countries starting with the total agricultural land in, in hectares. And the top three countries are Australia, Argentina, and China. Quite wide diversity, but big countries. The organic share of total agricultural land in the country, top three are Liechtenstein, French Polynesia, and Samoa. Wouldn't have thought those, would you? Uh, wild collection and other non-agricultural areas, top three are Finland, Zambia and India. Total number of producers in the country, India, Uganda, and Mexico. Uh, total organic market in terms of sales, the United States, Germany, and France. And per capita consumption, Switzerland, Denmark, and Sweden. So you can see I've named all these countries and with the exception of India that was mentioned twice, no other country uh, was mentioned, so we have quite a lot of diversity here. A couple of other things I wanted to point out for you is that uh, from 2015 to 2016, organic farmland uh, increased by 15%. Now note that um, that was mainly because an additional 5 million hectares were added in Australia, but still many other countries increased, uh, which added to the global growth. Another thing I wanted to point out is that from 2015 to 2016, the increase in number of organic producers uh, was 300,000 or 
So, um, as I said, almost any country can be a leader in organic. So in closing, I just wanted to remind us, uh, as I just highlighted, that organic agriculture is growing. It's becoming more popular each year. However, we must remember that even with our huge, tremendous growth that we've seen over the last few decades, we're still less than 1.5% of agricultural land around the world. So we must be humble, yet persuasive. We must be persistent, yet flexible. We must be willing to collaborate with others, and we must walk our talk. Because through our own words and actions, we can be convincing to farmers, to consumers, to retailers, to governments, and to anyone wanting to learn more about agriculture and how organic can change the world and feed the world. Thank you.